this is, this is a sequence of interconnected causal loops. So the question might be, well, how does morality emerge from the bottom? And I would say, well, especially the morality that's associated with assuming that attention is something that's sacred, roughly speaking. Okay, so imagine you see someone really engaged in something. You might think, oh, I'd really like to be engaged like that, which is what you would think, right? Because everyone wants that. It's like, I'd like to be engaged. Okay, so then you might think, well, this person looks like they're um, fully alive, something like that. They're not being obsessed by catastrophes and all that. They're into what they're doing. What's that like? Okay, you'd say, well, that's associated with creative exploration. And then you might say, well, what, why is creative exploration useful? And the answer to that is because it can generate adaptive behavior of all sorts. Okay, so then what? Well, then you can imitate the adaptive behavior because we can use our bodies as representational devices. So we act out the person who's interested in something. So that's actually, in large part, why people like to buy art. You know, so lots of people I've seen buy art. They like to buy art because they also have some contact with the artist. And they want to have some contact with the artist because it's kind of cool to have contact with an artist. It brings something into their life. And the artist is definitely someone who's outside standard hierarchies. That's sort of what defines an artist. So then, once you imitate the adaptive behavior, then you can play around with the imitations a bit. And you can ritualize them. And then you can dramatize them. And, and drama is an interesting thing once it gets... Once it gets formalized you know because basically what you're doing imagine little kids they get together they lay out some rules for pretend play and then they run a pretend play simulation and then imagine like little Shakespeare Jr. is off to the side and he's taking some notes and maybe he watches six or seven different pretend play episodes and he thinks well this was the most interesting part of that and this was the most interesting part of that and this was the most interesting part of that I think I'll put those all together make them coherent we'll have a really good story and what the story is, is an articulated representation of a dramatic representation of a set of procedures. It's two orders of abstraction, right? And you know this, because when you read a book, I mean, this doesn't happen to me anymore, because I think I've read too many books, but I can remember when I was a kid, when I was reading a book of fiction, it was as if the, 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 what was being described was playing out in my imagination as embodied figures. So, you know, sometimes you go to a movie of a book you've read and you think, oh, that person doesn't look anything like the person in the book, you know, because you have a representation of what the person is like. I found as I've got older that, and I don't really understand this, is I don't have that anymore, but I still understand the books. So I must have become so automatized that that's all gone. It's, it's, it's a loss, I would say. But anyway, it doesn't matter. You see that once you get the bloody drama written down, or even when you can say it, when you can tell a story, you're so close to having the, the pattern revealed in an articulated manner. You can't say what the pattern is, but you can describe it. Well, once you can describe it, well, you're right next to philosophy, right? As soon as we have a set of dramas that we can all agree on, especially once they get written down, then we can start thinking about the dramas. And that's when philosophy enters the stage, as far as I can tell. It's like the groundwork for philosophy is already laid by centuries and centuries of human interaction. And we keep abstracting that up to the point where we can represent it, and then we can pull out general principles. And we discuss them and debate about them, but that's the birth of philosophy. And all those levels interplay. Like, it's not just the causal direction isn't just from creative exploration forward. It's each time you add a new level, that interacts with the previous level, right? So you can talk about how you're going to play, or you can analyze literature, you know, or you can think about what you're going to write about. So, so each time you add another level of the capacity for abstraction, you make the whole system much more dynamic and complex. So the causal links, that's why there's all those little arrows on the outside. All of those areas are interacting with each other. So, yes. Yeah, too many arrows. Yeah, let me show you something here. This is quite cool. See that? Did I show you that before? Oh, this is so cool. It's mind-boggling, this thing. Okay, so the horizontal line. You see all the little squiggles that are underneath that? Okay, every one of those lines is a biblical verse. And the length of the line corresponds to how many references there is to that verse in other places in the book. 
So you look at the bloody thing, man, that thing's hyperlinked like mad And that's partly why the book, the, you know, the, think about this book, like a normal book, really what you do you, know, you go see a movie and there's a timeline, there's a beginning and a middle and an end But it's illusory, right, because the person who was writing the movie saw the whole thing at once And so they could use their knowledge of the ending to, to fiddle around with the beginning And they could use their knowledge of the middle to fiddle around with the end That doesn't happen in real life so you can lay this out. Now, imagine you've got a story, and it's like 5,000 years old, and 150,000 people have edited it. And they all knew the end and the middle and the beginning, and they just go like this. Well, this means this, and that refers to this, and that refers to this, and that refers to this, and this means that. And Well, you end up with that. It's like... It's infinitely dense. You can't get to the bottom of it. There's no way. And really, it's hyperlinked. So, you, I could, you could say that, in a sense, the Bible is the world's first fully hyperlinked document Weird, so, yep Yes, and, and part, of that's, part of that's actually conscious Like, one of the things that people do when they're criticizing Christianity Is say, well, if you look at the Gospel stories, for example There'll be a little story about Christ, and then there'll be this line that says, Thus fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. And the biblical scholars say, look, that was put in later, and the reason it was put in later was because the, the hypothesis of the Savior is nested in the Old Testament. And it keeps partially coming true with all these prophets. So a prophet is like a partial Savior. And in the Old Testament, prophets are just popping up like mad, and usually what happens is, Israel gets degenerate for one reason or another, it's because the king isn't being a good Marduk, basically And so then, a prophet who's very insightful, like Nietzsche or Dostoevsky, pops up and says Hey, you're not paying attention to the orphans and the widows And you better get your act together, because otherwise God's going to come along and like flood you out Or your enemies are going to stream in And of course, often, weirdly enough, the kings listen, because they think, God, this person is either completely insane or or God's talking to him, because otherwise he wouldn't be marching into the court when I could have his head cut off with one-tenth of a second's orders So often they kind of half pay attention But what happens, and this is Northrop Fry's interpretation fundamentally is that the whole Old Testament is the construction of an empire, Israel It's collapsed because of its failure to follow the fundamental moral order Then it rises again, collapses, rises again, collapses The first story like that is the Flood Right? And that's a really, really old story You know, the, the Bible doesn't get quasi-historic until Abraham The stories before that, so that would be Like the creation of the world, Adam and Eve um, The Tower of Babel, Cain and Abel No, no, that's later, Noah And then, it, then the Abrahamic stories start, and that's more like the history of Israel Even though it's also mythologized The, the first set of stories, man, those things are old who knows how old? Really old. 50,000 years old, maybe. They're old. So, anyways, what happens across time is that people have all these biblical books, and it's like what the Mesopotamians had to do in order to organize their society. It's like, oh, we've got all these writings. They're all sacred, hypothetically. They contradict each other. They don't seem to be in any order. Like, what are we going to do about that? And so then there's this collaboration of minds across centuries to think, Oh, well, it kind of looks like this might go there, and then this might go there, and this refers to that, and this refers to that And so it is, it's, it's trying to It's the collective imagination of humanity trying to make a coherent story out of experience That's what it is And, you know, it's, you might say, well, it's our best guess Is it true? Depends on what you mean by true Right? That's a very, very tricky question Partly this, the question it's trying to answer is, how should you act? That's not the story, that's not a scientific story But it's a bloody important question